Welcome to our Grape Cask Lazy Susan. I kind of got, I had a lot of fun with this project because this is a real neat wood faux finish kind of background thing. This is where I started out with my Lazy Susan. So where I ended up. I think I'm going to use the glass, um, the glass candle, what's it, what's it called, the glass, there's a hurricane, sorry. And then I want to show you a little bit about the Lazy Susan. This is a Lazy Susan that you can, you can change this puppy, so I can make this the brown color of my piece. And just twist this pup, this puppy, this nugget off, and you can buy extras of these on the website. And then re-put it on to change the Lazy Susans. They have, we have scallops, and now we have this round shape. I'm excited about both. And they can stack and store, and what's neat about them is you can flip them over and paint on the back side. So now you have at least a two season, but if you put four of them and they stack up, they store right on the base so you don't have to worry about storage someplace else. If you use the glass hurricane and put a little candle in the middle, then, um, then you don't have to worry about changing out any of this kind of stuff. The, um, the, there's a magnet in the middle, and what the magnet is for is you glue a little washer on the bottom of whatever you want to put on here, and that decorates this finial. This, um, this nugget, I guess, actually. Originally, we had only scallop panels. I really wanted something other than round. Go figure, right now I've got a round and I'm all excited about it. But um, because they were scalloped, we needed this center nugget to be a key so that it would lock the scallops in together so that when you stacked them, they would stay all lined up. So I hope you enjoy this lesson. It's just a lot of fun. As we get ready to paint this fantastic round Lazy Susan panel that is reversible, we don't worry about these burn marks. It's laser cut. That's why they're there. Um, but they just paint right over, so that's not a problem. Um, but I want to make this look like a wine cask barrel top. And um, I want to do a faux kind of wood treatment on this. And so we're going to go through some kind of fun shenanigans. Um, I think that you'll get a lot out of this. All right, the first thing that I need to do is I like the color and the tone of this wood, and it seems like that might be around near where I want to um, paint. I've got my deco art color book that I created using baseball card sleeves. And I want to choose a color that's kind of similar to this background because I think it's about the right color. And some go too warm and some go too cool. Sometimes it's just really hard to find exactly what you're looking for. I think I'm going to go with fawn and cocoa, and we'll do a kind of a both colors on there kind of thing. I need a big brush, so I'm going to use a one inch oval glaze um, that's Patty's Fair Dry Brush. I've got both my colors out on my palette, and normally I would roll this on, but I don't want to get a pebbly texture, um, and so I want to also start right away defining where my streaks are going to go. Dirty brush, I'm just going to lay these two colors in here in straight lines. You could seal your surface if you wanted to. This is a hard surface. Um, it's man-made, man man-manufactured, so I'm just not going to worry about it. So I'm using it dry and streaky. This, the reason that we call these a dry brush is because they make these dry, streaky looking striations um, because of the way the brush is cut. That doesn't mean that you have to paint with dry paint. This is just going to be a little bit of a layering process. I'll just keep going back and forth until I get everything based. And The reason I want it all based, normally I would maybe put streaks on and then I wouldn't worry about where I didn't have it based. But it just for explaining and stuff and teaching the video and that kind of thing. I just, I'll go ahead and coat everything. It just makes it a little bit easier. Then there's no mistakes on your end if I forget to tell you some stuff later on. Just nice long strokes and I'm getting a little wonky there. I gotta keep myself straight. Um, I have astigmatism and people with astigmatisms tend to paint things cockeyed or leaning anyway, not cockeyed maybe. Now you could paint this with just faux wood and not paint anything on it. You could paint this and um, put grapes all around it. You could paint this and do words. Um, 
You could do like um, your own family winery crest. There's a lot of things you can do once we get the wood grain on here. Okay, I think I pretty much got it all coated. It already looks better, huh? Just gonna make sure that I got next to here. If you're juicing on the paint, it's not gonna look very good. So you wanna not juice it on. And when, I, when I'm lifting off of my brush, I'm flicking, and that leaves not such a blunt line. And I'm making a mess on my table on purpose so that um, that it just, um, it carries the paintbrush right off, so you want to protect your table. Okay, I'll blow dry it, and then we'll be ready for the next step. Okay, to make my pattern lines really straight, now you're not going to need to worry about this, but what if your Lazy Susan isn't exactly the my size Lazy Susan or whatever? I want to show you how to do the things I'm doing. Kind of along the teach a man to fish kind of standpoint. I'm using tracing paper on a roll because it comes wider. I hate, dislike, terribly dislike um, taping four pieces together. And when you see what I'm about to do, you'll see why I really don't like it. All right, so I'm going to lay my piece, which I did not blow dry yet, because I realized I could do this without blow drying it, and it would probably be dry by the time I get done. I'm going to lay this in the middle. This is curling up a little because I'm at the end of my roll. If you simply bend it backwards, it'll quit doing that. Okay, so I'm going to lay it there. And notice that I did my... Um, I did my lines on a, what do you call that, 90 degree angle from, if that's 90 degrees, I'm not sure, from the square that's in the middle. And that's going to help me. And I'm going to even put a line here and here so I remember what I'm doing once I take this board away. Okay, we want that in there to be able to line it up. Okay, so now in order to get even, evenly spaced, um, planks, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold this in half and I'm going to make sure that my little liner things here line up together. Okay, so there's my very first one. And I think, let's see, how many planky things do I want? Hmm, let's find out. So I think we're going to do maybe five of these planky things. We definitely want the edges to be shorter. So now what I've got to do is every time I fold, it's got to be in a line with this. So I think what I'm gonna do is do something a little bit different than that. I'm gonna go ahead with my T-square. I want it straight. That's the most important thing. So I'm gonna go straight here. I'm gonna go in metric and go between the 14 and the 15, whatever that is. And then give myself a line. Okay, now I have a folding line, and that's that's important. Okay, and then maybe we want them about this yay wide. Okay, so come here again, and we'll say the three. And the three. Okay, now I'm going to run out of ruler here because this is however many inches wide. 14 inches, 16 inches, something like that. So I'll have to flip it over and go from the other direction. Two things can happen when you're putting planks in. Um, number one, the smaller, the smaller you make your planks, um, the smaller the piece, the smaller you can make your planks, but it can get busy, so you want to be careful about it getting busy. And since this is a whole one, this is two and a quarter, so we'll go here and see what two and a quarter gets us. And we're going to end up with an odd shaped one in the middle. Let's see what we do. Well, we can stretch it, so we could split the difference between this one and then split the difference between this one, but I don't know about the 
having one right smack down the middle. That would give us one, two, three, four, five, six. Hmm. Yeah, that's going to give us an even number. I don't like that. So, back at drawing board. And then what we'll do is we'll make this one be a little bit less. And we'll split some differences here. watch the rest of the torture, but you see where I'm going. I'm going for an odd number of planks, and as soon as I get my odd number of planks established, and they'll be nice and straight because I folded this and I used this little square as my grid, then we can, um, then we can trace those on and we'll know that they're going to go exactly in a row in a row. Alright, I want to lay my pattern on and I want to just loosely trace my lines because when I do this, it's going to show me where my staves are, and if my staves are, make sure my drain is going that way, if my staves are running that way, then I'll know where I need to do my faux wood treatments, if that makes any sense at all. All will become clear. So, I've got this fantastic tracer that is a roller ball that has a rubberized grip, which is so wonderful. It makes tracing much more comfortable. I always do the death grip of doom when I'm tracing. All right, so I'm going to get my staves on there. Rah. I don't care if they're straight right now because I'm going to cover them, cover them up. I just need to know about where they're going to be. Now I want to put some traditional raw umber kind of where I'm going to want chips and cracks and things like that to be. So maybe closer to the edges. of randomly spaced. Just putting on a little ha-cha-cha -cha here and there. Let them dry. I'm going to use our Clapham Salad Bowl Wax. And we're going to use a palette knife. Okay, and I'll take this and I'm going to just kind of put this in this dark area, kind of following my line. Just a little bit, you don't need to overdo it. What we're going to do is a resist kind of a look, and it's going to keep this dark but look like chipped paint. Make them irregular, don't make them all the same. Try to have them coming around the cracks. I guess you could have knots where there aren't where there aren't the um, edges. I guess I'm not being very wood-like in my attitude. Maybe I'll put a great big one right here. Don't make it too flat with the wax um, because then you won't know where where you put it. Okay, so that's the end of that. Now we're going to paint all over this puppy, doing the same thing we did before. Keeping our strokey streakies. We want to keep some of this background color, okay? So make sure you keep some of your colors. Don't worry about your lines. You know where they're going to be. You've got a pattern for them. I'll just spit out. And I've got some driftwood. I think I'm going to need to shake my paints. Okay, so spit out some driftwood. It's our light color, some khaki tan, another kind of lightish color. Let's do some traditional raw sienna. I think they're both the same color, yeah. And we've got our umber out already. Get our big dry brushing brush. And I am going to stand up for this, so I'm just going to try and sit down, but nah, I don't think so. So, just want to pick up the colors 
and streak them. Remember, we're not covering everything up. I want an aged barrel. So just continue to streak. I want it a little bit warm like a wine barrel would be. Now this is what's freaky about this kind of thing. This, there's just no right or wrong placement. So you've just got to play with it. Remember we're keeping those wood streaks. Don't cover up everything here. Leave some of that showing. Like it's a little bit sanded off or something. Tap around your streaks. Don't dig into it. Your not your streaks, but your wax. Okay. Do you see how we're getting that kind of mottled? The brush, it's, you know how they say it's all in the wrist? Well, it's all in the brush. If you have a brush that's ill-suited to this, it won't work. So you do need the right brush. I'm going to get into a little bit of that driftwood. Those highs and lows, um, warms and cools, I'm going to go over here and tap around that. I'm going to come back and streak. Those are what are going to make it look old. You know, like almost like there's lichen growing on it. Well, fungus never hurt anybody, right? Okay, streak to blend that. So I had to do a little bit of tapping and then I went back and started streaking it. Layer it. If you get something bad, go through and make it good, you know? I so lied. I'm not going to end up with very much of this background showing. I like that edge piece. Okay, we want to brush away from us so that we can take off. And we'll have some of this dark coming through. Liking it. Looking okay, nice and aged. Fix it. There we go. I think down here we'll make sure that we leave a little bit of that edge showing through as well. I saw these um, I saw these um, lazy Susans in a Tuscan kind of I saw finished ones, you know, or ones that were real casks or something like that, but they were hundreds of dollars. And I thought, you know, we could do a faux. We could sew faux, right? Okay, now we take a look at the overall thing and I see that I've got more dark over here than here. So I'll go back while it's still wet and I'll work in. That really umbery dark stuff just makes it look way older, I think. There's so much stuff in my brush that that's what makes it interesting is you just don't know what's going to come out next. If you push a little harder, you get different streaks. All right. There's that. And I think we'll orange that up a little bit over here. Okay, I've got our grain running straight, basically. Now maybe we'll want this to orange up a little bit over here. Cool. 
Okay, these might end up being a little bit too big, these little streaky poos that I got going here. Let me make sure that I don't end up with them all being dark all the way down and around. So I'll go back in and adjust. Now that may all wipe off and be different. I'll deal with that later. Cool. I always feel like I'm working for Walt Disney World or something like that when I do stuff like this. You could do this on tin. You could do this on just any surface you want. You just use the same technique. Okay, now you can hit the blow dryer, but if you hit the blow dryer, you're going to melt your wax, which is an okay thing, but your paint has to be dry before you melt your wax. So um, you need to dry it on cool, you could do. But as soon as it dries, then we're going to heat each spot with the blow dryer, wipe it off, and that's going to leave us our chip that's there. So um, we'll let it dry kind of naturally, I think. Okay, now I've got this dry, so now I'll hit without trying to, on hot, each of these spots until the wax liquefies, and then I'll wipe it off. What that does, what that does is it gives us, let me get in here for you to see, it gives us a really, 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 on the other way, good rough little edge right there. Just it's, it's just like it's worn off or whatever. Um, nice. So, um, but then we want to try, don't wipe into the surface if you can because that'll spread wax everywhere and we need to keep the wax off because paint won't stick to wax. So watch for that. Alright, so now we have to degrease, or de-wax, which is, I guess, the grease. Um, and I'm going to use a goof-off wipe, which I found at the hardware store. And I want to not move, remove my paint, so I have to get in and get out quickly. Okay, and I am removing my paint, so you want to be real careful. We want to, no grease, very little paint removal. Go with the grain. I didn't wipe that one off at all. And then the way you test to see if you got your grease off is you put some water on that spot. Okay, so we'll go in with our brush, any brush, any brush. And if it doesn't beat up, then your grease is gone and mine is gone. Now I have to let that dry. All right, I got out weathered wood. Crackle mediums are all a little bit different. Some are time sensitive, some are um, uh, chemical sensitive. This one is chemical sensitive. Not that it's a chemical, but it is. Um, it will crackle a year from now. Um, Delta makes a wood crackling weathered product. I can't remember what it's called, but theirs, if you don't get into there and actually get it dry or apply your second coat of paint when it's still wet, then, then you don't have another opportunity. So each of them is a little bit different um, and you need to read the jars. Definitely, definitely read the jars. Now what I want is I want crackled wood and I don't want it everywhere. So I'm gonna go in to my weathered product and I'm going to put on a nice even finish coat here and there wide and skinny not everywhere kind of maybe a third have some of it solid and some of it streaky don't sneak up on it but don't overdo it either Some long, some short. Definitely go with your grain. Wow. This is kind of some thick, goopy stuff. Now we're going to do other layers of this, so don't think you're getting there all at one time. 
All right. Now I'm going to let this dry just until it is, and I'll let you see like my reflections to see how much I did. Um, we're going to let this dry just until um, until it's good to the touch, and then we're going to start streaking stuff again. All right. Now I have. You should see the mediums I've ha I've got out over here. This is going to be a a layered mess here. All right. I want to get out some graphite. A little bit of graphite. The raw umber. I need to go find a bottle of burnt umber. And the traditional raw sienna. And we'll get out khaki. Okay, and burnt umber. So that's my palette looks like this. I'll leave this here so you can kind of see. Go back a little bit. All right. Now, in order to get a good thick crack, you've got to lay it on the paint on top thickly. The medium doesn't need to be thick in the case of weathered wood. So I'm going to dry my brush out. And we're going to lay the paint on. This is not so much the streaky look, because if you don't lay it on, then it's not going to it's not going to do what you need it to do. So I'm going to get some juicy paint. I want some burnt umber. I don't have any umber on this. I'm going to toe in. To, I've got like three colors on there. I'm going to toe into these I'm just going to go ahead and just streak but lay now I'm kind of being contradictory towing in I've got a triple loaded brush just kind of blend it a little bit Go into some of my light, that's what I've got on my brush. I want those cracks, so if I don't have thick, gooey paint, I'm not going to get my cracks. But if I have it too thick and gooey, it's not going to, um, it's not going to be, I guess, subtle. So i got to go back in, and now I've got to smooth this in between. It's just really changing the look of this already, don't you think? Smooth those, transition them together. Now you don't want to play in the crackle medium. So you get out of there. Like as soon as you're done, you let it dry. We can always play on top of it later. So I'm going to pull up a whole wad of the four paints. This is really a juicy paint. Your piece will probably weigh more than after you're done really really need juicy paint to use to make the cracks crackle appropriately now it's also important that your underneath looks a little bit different than your top so if I was crackling on the same color all I would get is texture and you'll notice I'm going kind of into my my um, worn off areas it may be that you might want to wait until you, to remove those until after you get, um, and that's probably actually what I should have done, is put my wax on and then remove it after I do all of this mess. However, these kinds of projects are just definitely process projects. You just don't ever know, you know where you're going until you get going there. Now that umber, if you mix it with too much of that light, I just got a lovely pink over here. And that's not good, so I'll get out some more of my um, raw sienna. I'll cover that up a little bit. I'm going next to those cracks. I'm not trying to cover them up, but I do definitely like the way it looks chipped, so maybe we don't want to cover everybody up. Get a little bit more blue on this side. I don't really have any. That um, graphite is my blue I'm talking about, and it, it's a cool looking color on top of with crackle and age, and it just adds. Blah. I got a burnt umber, uber. Okay, so I'm get over here. I'm gonna crack this puppy up. Put in some bowls.
I'll let that dry. I know it looks a little bit splotchy, but don't worry about it. Okay, since I have such a nice body of dark, I'm going to go ahead and crackle one more time with the weathered wood. My cracks turned out awesome. I don't know if you can see them. Let me get you in closer. Oops, that's further. Yeah. So see how that's dark and then it's got that light on top underneath and it just cracked on through. It's got a little pebbly texture. That's what you like. And so if you don't have juicy paint, it won't happen for you. So you gotta make sure you have juicy paint. Now so I don't like how heavy dark I'm getting on this other side here. So I'm gonna use this to my advantage. I'm gonna put in some crackle contrasting to where I had it before. So this is gonna this is going to crackle um, to the dark showing. All right, so I'm going to just go in amongst my darks and it'll give it a different look because it's crackling with the dark under instead of the dark. Um, instead of the, I finished my thought, right? Sometimes I get into my little creative brain and I forget I'm supposed to be talking. All right, so I think we'll just leave it there. I'll let that dry. See kind of where I put it. Just kind of alternating with what I had already done. We're going to end up with a fairly crackled piece, but it'll be crackled uniquely in each case. All right, so now it's time to even out um, the, the colors. I've got it a little bit streaky. I've got um, traditional raw sienna, I've got cocoa, and I've got the khaki. And I want to put, now we got to lay this on thick enough, but not so light. Even this out just a little bit. Need a little bit of dark. That's just obviously a little too light for its placement. So we'll get into some umber, burnt umber. Now this will start crackling like right as soon as you put it down. So you want to be really careful if you're going to go back in and mess with it. All right, so I'll just do this where I have the medium. Cover up some of this darker um, stuff. And you can cover up some of your other crackle. Um, you know, it just depends on the look that you want. I've done this before. Um, this may look a little freakish to you. Make sure, oh, one thing that I haven't addressed concretely is this crackle, the, um, the weathered wood, will crack in the direction that you stroke. So if you stroke all over woogly woogly, then it will not crack in a line. And that's what you want, is it to crack like the grain of the wood, kind of. So you gotta make sure. That you do it in the direction you're gonna want it. All right. And then I can go back in where I don't have crackle, or like over here I've got a lot, large body of um, just nondescript streaking going on. I can layer over my streaking and start looking for places to even out my colors. Maybe this got just a little bit. I can dry brush right on top. Staying out of my wet crackle. So see that's getting that a little bit more even. Then we're going to do a wash and some other things. Okay, that's much more even. I'm gonna have to address this when I get this dry. Let's go over here and play in that for just a minute. That's a little bit more even. I'm looking for a consistent tone to make this look like it's gonna be all the same product, kind of. If it looks too splotchy, then I won't, um, it won't be believable as wood. So I've got to get it looking like it all stayed in a barn somewhere and aged, if that makes any sense. Okay, so that's much more even, and we'll let that rest and dry. All right, next we're going to use staining and antiquing medium. This is a medium that will reactivate with water um, after you 
get started going. So you're going to need to seal this um, before you move on to the next um, thing. Otherwise, when you float on it, it'll reactivate and lift. So you do want to be careful when you use this product. What I want to do is apply, because it's water activated, I'm going to stay out of my water. Get a big old ginormous brush. It's the oval glaze again. This one's just a little bit older and more beat up. <clears throat> I'm going to put this on the piece and coat it. I could use retarder to do this as well. I like the idea of it being moisture activated because then I can kind of wake it back up and nudge it around a little bit if I want to. Okay, so I'll get this all coated. Go both ways when you're doing your... Um, Go ahead and work it in just a little bit. Don't talk it dry though. Like I can see I've got some dry spots. Um, sometimes I have a tendency of talking my way all the way through the drying time of the product. <clears throat> It'll catch wherever you don't have the medium worked in. So you do want to make sure that you've got that. Okay, and we're going to take some traditional burnt umber. Now, if you want to do this in layers, you're going to be a little bit limited. First, we're going to take a mix of our um, camel, is it camel or cocoa? Cocoa. And raw, um, traditional raw sienna. And I'm going to mix it half and half with the medium. And this should be nice and sheer. This is going to be my great makeup leveler. Okay, so I've got to go straight. This is going to mask things. It's dragging just a little bit, which is perfect because that's giving me those streaks. I don't want a base coat. I'm just looking for some like makeup to make it even out, even its tone out, just a little bit. Okay, hold this down. Wow, ah, too much. So now I could wipe that right back up if I wanted to. Okay, my cracks are showing through. I'm not covering anything up. to the edges. Whoa, go off the edge. Okay, so that's getting kind of cooler. Mix up some more. This might be a good standing up time. I'll just look for things that are really noticeably uneven and mask them down just a little bit. too much. Okay, I'm liking that. See, I'm squinting at this and I can totally picture it with my, um, with my, oh, like brown antiqued edges and a little bit of iron kind of color on it and my grapes and things like that. So I can totally totally see this going, the, the planks which aren't even on here yet. Alright, we'll leave it there and get it dry and then I am going to apply a coat of varnish. Alright, so to varnish, use a black um, nitro glove, these are chemical free kind of gloves, a varnish sponge which is dry, you could use it damp don't want to use it wet though. And you just wipe on an even coat of varnish. And you can keep painting on paint after it dries, so that's what I'm doing. I'm just applying a coat of varnish and then I'll just keep doing one coat of varnish and then I'll just keep on keeping on with my project. Alright, we're going to get ready to add some of our details to this. So, I get out my artist buddy. 
get out my half pipe compass. Half pipe, half pipe compass will it has a lid, which is fantastic, and that has extra leads which are stored in the handle. And this is just a real easy way to get a perfectly even border without having to go through all kinds of shenanigans. And the lid prevents you from stabbing yourself when you try to dig it out of your paint box, or your brush box. Okay, so what I had decided was I want to go ahead and make this be like it's a rim of some sort, um, like a wooden rim or something. I haven't quite, quite decided. Got a brand new piece of blue choco paper. They have white choco paper. We carry white choco paper. Um, it's brand new though, so I don't want all of this concentrated stuff on here. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a little wipe down. Whoops. And a tear down. No problem. We use that for smaller pieces. Okay, and it just takes off the residue. I lined up my lines, and now it's time to get my planks on the piece. Get out my triple threat here. I know I'm going to want these lines basically straight, but I don't have to worry about them being perfectly straight because there's going to be some little variations and stuff. The neat thing about the choco paper is it erases with water. So you don't have to erase it. I can be a little bit tougher on it and not worry about any residual lines because it'll come right off. Okay, I got out a number one um, angle shader. Don't be afraid of using a bigger brush. Um, it just gives you a lot more control, actually. It doesn't seem like it would but it actually does. I'm going to use the traditional burnt, no, raw sienna, raw umber, sorry, the dark browning color stuff. And I'm gonna float my lines. Now, if I wanted to get them really perfect, I could probably um, use some tape or something on this. Although you do wanna make sure that you're very dry before you do something like that. And I've gotta do a lot of flip floating. And then I'm not gonna be able to see my lines. Probably could have used that white graphite in this case. Now what I don't like about the choco paper is it erases with water. So as soon as I floated next to it, the line disappears. However, in this case, I don't care because I want the lines to disappear. So it's actually a bonus. As soon as I get that line floated on there, I'm going to float the other side. The whole line will be erased and I won't have to mess with it anymore. Let me give you just a little floating tip here. When you're floating with a very big brush, just only put paint right on that toe. Okay, and with angle shaders, usually you want to fl uh, blend this way and then this way. Just do a little crossing motion, and that way you don't end up with this big drag. Look at all that extra juice I've left on the palette. And I'm just going to float all of these lines the same way that I just did. All right, I've decided I want it a little bit darker. And so I'm going to mix a little bit of black and turn my angle shader on its edge. And now it's become a wide liner brush. Because I'm leading with the front end, the back end of my brush, it's pre-wetting that area and it's allowing that, um, the pre-wetting allows the paint to flow right into its spot, if that makes any sense. So. Um, sometimes having a great big ginormous brush is truly beneficial. If you're afraid of it, just give it, give it a shot. Raw. We don't want to get too black here. That right up there just seems like it got just a little bit too black. So I'm going to haya, karate chop it. And then we'll keep going. So yeah, I like the depth of that. That makes it look more like there's some separation between the planks. And now I'll shade around this rim that I put on here. And I'll shade first rather larger with the um, traditional raw umber. And then I'll float thinner or smaller or tinier with the black mix. And I went ahead and put on a little bit bigger rim. I've got it with that graphite and it's a little hard to see. 
So rather than fight it, because I'm just going to absolutely torture myself, then what I will do is I will get out my triple threat and get to the white lead. And I'm going to go right back and give myself that line. All right, now I can at least see where I'm going. So then I'll just go right up next to that line. Nice thing about the yellow, not the, um, the, the nice thing about the Ghost Rider is it also erases with water or varnish so you don't end up with lines stuck on there. So I can sketch all over this thing. The lines will come off nicely. Okay, I'm gonna keep it as round as possible. going to make it look like there's that little edge right up here. And we've got some more magical stuff to do to it. So I've been wondering what to do with the whole part of this thing and I've just decided that I think I'm going to make it into the hole for the, um, the cork itself. I'm going to find a circle device big enough. Not, yeah, for the, you know what I'm talking about. Now we'll take our compass and we'll decide that our barrel stave things are going to be about that big. And then we want to make marks using our compass. So we'll make our first line and then we line our compass up. And we've got to make sure, this is a little bit slippery because of, and maybe actually what I can do is use my, that's what I'll do. I'll line this here and then I'll make my mark with the white, which is a lot easier to see. It's a great easy way to measure without having to measure. Okay, we'll just go all the way around, marking it so that we can make our little barrel edges on here. Okay, so we're gonna open up. I just have to tell you, I just went and opened up this bottle of paint and I couldn't open it um, because this gloomy, guammy thing got all stuck up in there. Um, Pop Tops, absolutely your best friend. This just relies on just a little bit of, what do you call that, leverage stuff and absolutely awesome. They're cheap, they're easy to use. Um, I used paint adhesion medium and painted this little blue delf pattern on mine. Um, their plastic paint adhesion medium sticks to plastic and I mean I'm being brutal on these edges here and you know all I have is a little bit of marking from the colors of paint that I've used and some washi marks so just absolutely fantastic both the paint adhesion and the popped up all right we're gonna get out this big um, angle shader again we're gonna corner load with a nice deep darkly load and we're going to need to do a flip float on these. So we'll just go around. I'm using my artist buddy to quickly and easily just keep on painting. You know that uh, keep on trucking sign, right? Same kind of thing. Just keep on painting. I have to tell you, um, this is one of those tools that once you have it, you just have to use it. You just love it. When you get all the way around marking, if you didn't quite have enough room to make a full mark, just kind of split the difference. Mine was pretty darn close. So I just measured that stave. Now flip, what a flip float means is we're going to go back and we're going to flip our brush over and right on that line, we're going to make a joining float. Generally speaking, you don't want there to be a ridge in the middle of your flip float. You want it to be very smooth. People use them for um, fruit and things like that. But this is not this is not your average um, type. Well, the flip floating is a technique that I wouldn't use for fruit anymore. Um, there's so many other tools and things that you can do. 
so. And in this case, if they join together, it looks like that crack that is in between the barrel staves. Make sure that they're all radiating outwards. These can be a little bit harsher floats. I'm not really even adding any water as I get around. The nice thing is the paint is taking off the um, the paint is taking off the graphite or the ceramic lead that I used to mark it with, so we don't even have to worry about erasing. Now we're going to take a number two round. I'm going to use an old number two round. I'm going to put black in with my um, black in with my um, and I'm just going to mix just a slight amount of water. I want it to be a brownie black kind of color. And then we're going to go in, and we're going to give it that line everywhere. And then, I don't need to show you every stinking one of these things, but then what we need to do is we need to go in, I'll go with umber first. We need to go in, and some of these need to be falling apart. Okay, so that's going to be one that's just, you know, it's got its cracking, it's chipping, it's doing whatever it does. And then when we get that part done, then we'll go into the inside with a blacky brown kind of mix and show just a little bit deeper where it's falling apart. So um, you'll do some of those in some places, but slightly round all of these edges because they've been worn, right? That's where the edges of the, the cask have um, worn out. And we can go in here, and instead of it being perfect, we can chip and wear some of that, and we'll go ahead and line. I think that's a good idea. With our blackly brown, we'll go ahead and line and round those edges. And that's going to give it just a really awesome um, kind of worn edge. And then we'll highlight next to it just to give it that next step of raisedness. Okay, let's get you in a little bit closer. I'm feeling like you're missing out on a little bit of the detail here. Okay, so what I'm also going to do is I'm going to round a little bit the back side, and then I'm going to run this light, this round brush here and there along the edge to make that be that chipped, worn edge. Okay, so as we come around here, I don't want that to end. Some will be off, some will be on. really random, shaky a little bit, just worn, you know, and you don't want to, don't bring it in too deep and over exaggerate it, but we really do want it to look a little bit like there's worn edges on both sides, because they, you know, they knock these barrels around and throw them down the stairs and all that kind of stuff, so. Just give it that worn look. Have fun with this. This is the funnest part of painting, I think, is adding this kind of goofy stuff. Alright, so now we have it all kind of the edges antiqued and stuff. Now we need to add a little bit of a highlight to show that this edge is higher than this edge. And it's already a lighter color because we did all the shading down here, but we need a little bit more. The deeper and darker the shading is down here, the further down it's going to look. So you could go in with, say, your black, and I'll do this upside down and backwards, and you could deepen that shading right next to that real narrow, and then as soon as that dries, you would get the impression that that was just a little bit, oops, farther down, okay? So, but what we're going to do next is we're going to highlight... right next to the edge, right there. Let's get you on camera. And I don't want it to be everywhere, and that's not quite light enough, so we're going to use um, 
maybe the cocoa mix. That's almost a little too yellow. It looks a little bit too happy to me. Just We're going to shimmer some of that along the edge in a little bit of a spotty fashion. And keep it out of our black, kind of following that line. The more kind of wobbly your hand is, the better off you'll be. If it gets too light, mix a little bit of the traditional raw sienna in with it. So I'll do one more time and then I'll, whoops, we don't want this floating. We want it chisely. This is what angle shaders do best, is they act as like a little guide kind of. They just, they just lay that color right where you want it. Okay, as I'm doing this, I'm not so sure that I'm loving the color that I've got. I'm not, eh. I'm going to switch colors and see if I like that better. And if that doesn't work, then I'm going to, um, I'm going to change to khaki tan. And that might be a little bit light, so I may have to put something in with it. Um, but if that doesn't work, I might shade darker to make my top appear lighter. I just feel like I'm making kind of merry sunshine or something like that. I don't know. I don't like that's nah, really light. Let's see how we like it when we get it on there. So I actually think I like that better, but I think I'm going to put a little bit of camel in with it. Oh, cocoa, sorry. Okay, and. Like that. Can't decide. I'm going to do a couple more and then I'll bring it back. All right, I think I can like that. I think yeah, as long as I don't get it too liney. So I think, like, if I compare it with over here, I feel like I have more of an edge. So I think I'm going to go with that. And you don't have to. You could probably very easily skip this step. Um, I'm skipping them over things. Don't have to do everything the same. Don't do everything the same. Whatever you do, do not do everything the same, because then that will be, I don't know, too uniform looking. And then my last thing that I think I will do to this edge is I think I will go ahead with a thin, sheer black float. Get you up here so I can go in the right direction here. And just under some of the deeper stuff going into those cracks and things, I'll add a little deepening, very chisely, very, very chisely. Really don't want a whole bunch of, um, I don't want a big, fat, flat, black float, which I couldn't say again if I wanted to. Okay, and we'll just do that all the way around, just to deepen it, just one more step. So I've messed around in my brain just a little bit with how I'm going to put the pattern and stuff like that and had a consultation with the more logical people in our crowd. Get me centered here. All right. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sketch. And then, like, I was going to stop here and have it just be um, just like the cask. And then we were going to have a patternless pattern packet. But because I'm kind of getting carried away and I'm just having so much fun, we're going to go for the whole shebang and we'll put the pattern up on the project page on the website for the, the round Lazy Susan panel. Now what we're going to do is have some grapes dripping down here and then we're going to have some coming in and winding down in here. So I'm going to do my winding ones first. And what I'm going to do is use my Triple Threat Ghost Rider and it's a ceramic lead, it erases with spit varnish, we've kind of, kind of gone over that. And we're going to bring around and just kind of mark maybe where our leaves are going to go. I'm going to have to look at a leaf. Do you know that artists don't usually draw things without looking at pictures of things? So whenever you feel like you can't draw, um, you need to take heart because artists can't draw without looking at things. So I know I'm going to want a leaf here. Somebody needs to give me a leaf. I've got pictures over here. Take a look and see how how do those things come out of there. Okay, so come out, come out. And and so the most important thing you'll notice when I'm doing stuff like this that I don't really take when I'm just doing like a sketchy thing, I don't really take my 
um, hand off as I'm sketching. And then you just I give myself these veiny things. I'm not expecting you to, to freehand anything. And I just kind of fill in where I think I want it to go. And then this one looks like it's trying to turn. So I'm going to make that one turn with my little eraser called saliva here. Okay, so Maybe that leaf got just a little bit, a little bit long. Let's turn it a little bit earlier. There we go. And it maybe could go a little bit wider. What I love about these is you can just kind of play with them until you get it where you want it. Okay. And we'll just have some, I'll put a couple more leaves in there. But this is what I would do if I was just sitting at home and trying to come up with something on this. I would take pictures of leaves, I would come up with a line that I like, um, you know, we wind them in and wind them out. Um, some of those slick parts, look at that, do you see that it's resisting the lead? I'll push a little bit harder. Fill that in just, now some of this can be real blobby and real loose. And I'm going to come up here, I'm going to sneak a couple bigger grape leaves up here. The pattern is going to be online, so go ahead and download the pattern. Um, directions are going to be part of the video. That's just, this is one of those things where you just really need to listen to how um, I've resisted putting patterns together that had faux techniques like this because you really need to watch it because when you see how many layers you start believing and when you see things overlapping you need to believe it. Um, and people don't so much in print um, believe because like you doubt that it takes this many layers of paint and, and glom and rub and all that stuff that we've done to get this effect. Anyway, so I'll be back with you in just a second when I get this drawn on. Okay, so I've got plantation pine and I've got, let's see, light avocado out. And I think what I'm going to do, start this kind of just casually and slowly, see where I end up. I don't know that I want a solid coverage. I can't decide if I want this to set back in the piece or come forward. So right now what I'm going to do is just choppy chop chop my leaf form and kind of just wash over and see where I get. This is probably not going to be um, not going to be dark enough. So I'm probably going to have to do the base coat thing. So, all right, into light avocado, and there we go. With a little bit more. Just repeat that step. Let the brush toe lead into the areas of the leaf and that will give you a much choppier, cooler angles on your um, brush. You can mix a little bit of your plantation pine in with this color. Keep rotating your piece around so that you get the benefit of that toe. Let the texture of the, um, of the boards kind of come through and pretend like it's dappling your leaf just a little bit. Don't don't go for the real big solid base coat. Real choppy, real just kind of artsy. And we'll let that dry and we'll come back and give it one more kind of sheer-ish coat. I really do want this to sit down. As I look up in the, the monitor here, um, it's really almost not showing at all. That's exactly kind of what I want. So I'll do a little highlight, I'll do a little shade, I'll do a little extra stuff, and um, I think we'll be pretty amazed at how how subtle but yet obvious it is. It'll be cool. I get really excited about doing this loose kind of painting. If you're afraid of painting loose, um, just try it and see if you like it. Um, I used to be um, just a base coat shade highlight painter myself and then um, started taking classes with people who just really shined at um, loose and that just got me jazzed. So 
Just because you start out one way doesn't mean that's how you end up. So just tuck that nose on in there. If I see something else as I'm painting along to base these leaves up the top, um, I'll stop and come back to you. As you are base coating and you get ready to paint different leaves and do stuff, keep in mind that you've got a center of interest in your piece and that's going to be more, in this piece, it's going to be more towards the center and your eye can kind of draw things around. These leaves that are going to be kind of up and over, they need to be a little bit darker or a little bit more like their background color. So if your background color was very light, then you'll want to make your leaf color lighter and it will blend. Whereas if it was in the center of interest and it was on a light background, you would make your leaf color very dark and that would make it pop. In this case, we're going to need to make the middle leaves and the middle details brighter. So, um, okay. So that's just a, a note and an aside. And these little backgroundy ones that are underneath things, they can just kind of be a little blobbish. And it's just a filler kind of color back there until he comes out and, and is a whole leaf. But yeah, he can just sneak behind. He's behind this other big leaf there. And we don't want him to get too much ahead of this guy, but we'll get to him in a little bit. Okay, so these guys up here, remember to do your little haya into this. This brush, by the way, is a half inch. Whatever size you know you're comfortable with. This is just big enough to base and do the little haya kind of into the details of the grapes. Really adds a lot of shortcut to be able to do this. Um, to be able to do this both at the same time, base coat and begin the detail step. I don't know if you've caught this yet. Those of you who are newer may not have, but. Um, I'm big time into trying to save time. I don't like to waste time when I'm painting because I have more things I want to paint. So I try to just move it along so I can get to the next thing. Okay, now it's time for second base coat. Even a choppy. And it's getting a little bit solid there. I don't know if you could see that. I want it brighter without it getting real solid. So I'm adding a little bit of water. Just want to mask just a little bit more of the background. Just a touch. The idea is not to have these take over. It's just like a subtle, this is, you know, somebody's cask um, that got forgotten, you know, somewhere outside a barn somewhere or something like that. That's my intention is that this is an overgrown kind of um, I don't know, motif, I guess. I don't know what you'd say that is. Okay. All right, now I'm getting into some of the stuff that doesn't quite exist. When you see little polka dot lines on the pattern, that's telling you that it's just real ghosty. And so what I'm doing is I'm just washing in ghosty leaf shapes so that I don't have a bunch of leaves lying all around that um, don't have anchors. All right, next we're going to use a combination of mm, yum, 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 um, cocoa and burnt umber. Let me show you the big, giant brush loading technique here. Okay, so I'm loose um, paint with cocoa, and then just kind of run my brush alongside the burnt umber. And I think we'll start yeah, down here. And can you see, let's get you in tight. Push, twist, but not really twisty twisty. Got you right off camera, got you in so close you can't see anymore. Reload my brush, re wipe through the burnt umber. And we're going to highlight these. I actually want a little bit more time spent on my. Um, on my vines than my leaves and stuff in this case. Whoop. 
tube right. This little double load technique. Try not to make too big a pattern with your um, with your shaky, you know, like you get the little jittery thing going on. Try not to make it be too obvious that um, that it goes up and down, up and down like that, you know. You gotta make it and then see what I've done here. Let's see if you can even see what I've done. Okay. I've drawn this line. I've got this line is going straight stinking across the piece in like a super highway format. So no good, no good. I'm going to go back in and erase. And I'm going to bring this up. Get rid of that. And then maybe we'll sneak something else out here. Yeah, you got to watch those lines that just kind of do too much of a straight laced kind of thing. Okay, so I'll get that. And I probably need to bring something else off of here. Go up to the top. Do the same thing. So this isn't really going to show very much, but what it is going to do is give me a place to begin detailing the other lines. I found for those of you who have um, the laptops and things like that, I found a fantastic time to watch these kinds of videos. I get on the treadmill and totally feel like I'm not doing anything I shouldn't be doing by watching painting videos on the treadmill. Now all you have to do is get your internet connection over there. I'm having a great time doing it. Okay, so I think probably enough vines. We've got not so many vines going through here because they're all um, hidden by all that, that action and activity up there. So now I'll rinse my brush out and I'll go into straight um, cocoa. And then we'll run this just a little bit too light, I think. And run this straight down the center. Kind of hit and miss. And we'll also shadow in just a second as well. So take the cocoa, run it down the middle, and we can highlight or shade where we need to as well, depending on what, and do a little skip thing. Now because of the darkness of our background, in order to make these, um, these tendrils of vines, thank you, stand out a little bit more, we want to do a really skinny, so a little tiny load of paint float, not a lot of water, and I want it a raw sienna, no raw umber, sorry, traditional raw umber, and we'll go just right up next to what we want to accent, and we'll just shade right underneath, real skinny. The fatter something is, or the further away it is, the bigger the cast shadow that it'll put. So this is not far away, if I wanted it to be further away, I'd make it bigger. Okay, so you can determine how far away. Also, I guess, actually, I'm a liar. Let's take that away and let's play for a second. Maybe this one is far away, so you might have your shadow be underneath that, like it's casting the shadow down under. So you can play with your shadows however you want to. And I think for our purposes here, I don't like that sitting away, but I also know that I don't like it too close in, so we'll make that shadow just be a little bit bigger. Okay, so just do one side or the other. Choose your side and stick to it. And then we can also at this time go ahead and give our leaves that same ability to cast a shadow, and it's going to be just like drop drop shading on lettering. 
We'll put them all on the same sides, kind of. Let's get nice deep shadows down here. Batter four further away. And I'm not, like I said, not a lot of liquid in this float. Oops, this side. Okay, so we'll make our light source kind of be the same. Okay, I think that'll work. Just lifts everybody up. It adds a little bit more dimension, a little bit more depth. All right, now we're gonna do the same for the top. I was watching, like I said, I've been watching a lot of the little painting videos. Um, little like they're so cute or something. I don't mean it that way. Um, but I was watching painting videos while I was exercising, and one of the people that I was watching has a tendency of leaving out, like the photo has, like a water drop, and like I want to see the water drop. So. Um, try to give you everything but I don't want to bore you to tears either so finding that balance can be a little bit tough so do shadow those shady little shady little leaves let's get you on camera um, just a little bit just to, to give them a little bit more like body then you can shade on the shady leaves Just adds that little bit more. Interest to everything by having the shadows and then maybe this leaf is way out there. So maybe we can make him be a bigger cast and maybe he'll come up this other side since that whole thing is being shot down right there. And which means that we'll do the same thing to this side. And I can cut in any details that I didn't quite get. There we go. If I missed getting some fringy stuff happening on the edges of my leaves, I can chop it in and this step. Okay. And this one maybe we'll make that be around too so that it's a a big hanging up, shading a big spot down here, a leaf. Totally not using the right terminology, but I think you get what I mean. Okay, now we're going to do one of my favorite techniques of all time, which is um, dry rubbing. It's like so easy, you can do it with your eyes closed. I'm going to take a dry brush, which is a stencil, crescent stencil brush. This is a medium size. Totally dry, totally dry paper towel. And I'm going to go into my light avocado. And I'm going to dry off all my paint on my paper towel. And please ignore my really bad manicure. Okay, so and I'm going to rub right in the middle of the leaf where the kind of highlight, where I want the highlight to be, I guess. and just give it a little bit of a detail. And in this case, on the bigger leaves, I can highlight down the arms of the leaves and maybe not straight up the middle of the leaves. And that will give me that indent a little bit. In the little leaf um, case, I'm not gonna worry about it. Always dry off and rub where you want it the lightest first. and then repeat and that just gives it, let's see how it's already shading and folding and all that. that it's just such a neat easy easy technique you'll need a bunch of these little brushes they're super cheap don't cost you anything but um, if they get wet you can't use them so you have to wait until they dry and that's no fun and they're real 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 affordable um, you can actually do the same technique with this as you can with a nameless competitor's brand, which costs almost $20 a brush. And um, 
and then you need many of them and this is I think a couple bucks three bucks two bucks something like that it's a really really affordable I probably have 20 or 30 laying around here somewhere okay so get, yeah that just really adds some dimension to it As we get back to the dry rubbing, I think we could mix just a little bit of our, what is that, khaki tan, in with our green. I'm going to get to a new dry spot on my paper towel. Notice I'm keeping this palette really muted. I don't want this to be a screaming um, project. I don't want vibrancy. I really do want that kind of muted, earthy toned. Um, look. One of the things I wanted to say about this, um, we have a Lazy Susan for your patio set. Um, and it has a hole in the center that's round. It's made out of outdoor um, plywood. And so, um, it's like already weathered. You put your exterior varnish all over everything. Make sure you seal the tops and bottoms and all the edges and stuff. But you can totally put it on your umbrella. The umbrella goes straight down through the post. It's standard size, same size as your table comes. So then you can turn, you know how you've got that area in the middle that you can't put a tray and you know you've got people over and you want the glasses or the napkins or whatever to be on a tray that you can share because you can't reach across real easily on the outdoor tables. Well, that outdoor um, um, Lazy Susan is the answer to that because you can put all your stuff on the Lazy Susan. It's big enough to hold stuff. And then you can share all the stuff you need to oops, share. Throw your brush around. That khaki is just the perfect color for this. I've got another hydrangea pattern for that Outdoor Lazy Susan, as well as this pattern, which would be perfect for it. So now I'm going to sneak up and add just a little bit extra where I want it. Just pressing a little bit harder. And it I've built up a foundation of other color there, so that other color is not sitting on the flat, dark color that I, I based it. I'm loving it. I can give just a little rub to our background leaves, just something to say, hey, yeah, I'm really here. Okay, just a little dappled leaf moment. Yeah, look at how cool that leaf looks sitting there, just all shadowed and everything. That looks awesome. Now we need to make our veins. Our veins are going to be, we're going to do opposite. We're going to load watery burnt umber. And so why am I doing this? Well, the reason why is because on the dark, dark, dark background, um, we needed more of the light than we did of the burnt umber. But on our leaf, which is not as dark as our dark, dark background, we need less of the light and more of the dark. So I'm going to bring my leaf vein more leaning towards the um, burnt umber color. And I've actually got that color, just the highlight color, just resting on the tip of my brush and I can lean into it whenever I feel like I need to. And then you make your little vein lines. Not too many, because we don't want this too busy. It's not realistic painting. You do as much as you want. But just enough to say, hey, I'm a little leafy poo. Pull that in and do the others. hope that you're going to give this a try, even if you paint it on something else. There's so many, I, like I've done um, different clocks with this background. Um, clocks would be fantastic. So many people collect vineyard everything. If you're doing anything for shows, I cannot stress enough that wine is a big deal. And just because you don't know anybody that um, drinks wine or enjoys wine or whatever doesn't mean 
that um, when you're selling at a show that you're not going to have a big audience for that. It really depends on the kind of show. Obviously, if you're going to a big church show or something, then, then maybe people might resist that. But if you're anywhere near a trendier city, um, college towns, people are collecting wine now. Um, it actually is an investment. It's actually considered a really good investment, as long as you don't drink it, I guess, right? Ah, uh, that looks awesome. Okay, and we're going to finish the lower ones the same exact way. Alright, now a little bit of extra detail. We're going to go along where we really want our vines to be highlighted a little bit with a little bit of just side-loaded um, khaki tan that's going over that one. We'll do that. So you just have to decide where you want highlights to be. What needs to be popped? So I can see those much better now. This this one just kind of hides completely. So we don't want to do the whole thing. That was like a whoopsie. time of day. This spring we hope to get new windows for this part of the building. And that will help a lot with the noise. Okay, and if you needed any a little bit of extra, I think I'm I think I'm pretty happy with this. Um, I don't for my piece and we always judge our piece on our own piece merit. You know, don't judge it against your neighbors because if theirs has a real dark black background and yours doesn't, then, you know, obviously then you're not playing apples and apples. So you can give it little highlights on the all kinds of areas wherever you think you need to. Right, I'm getting ready to put my grapes in and what I'm wanting is just, I want my colors to really sit well together. I don't want the grapes to take off on their own. So I'm going to tone my palette. Okay, so how do we do that? So I've got my two colors. I've got black plum and I've got plum. If I put just plum on this piece, here, let me show you, then it's going to be kind of like, whoa, hair's a purple dot. So what, I, if, what if I do, we'll go into burnt umber and plum. And I put some burnt umber into that. Now it's still purple, but now it sets much nicer on my piece. So we'll start with that color. And what I want to do is just kind of real loosely, just kind of squiggle in my bungee grape sections. You don't have to worry about what they really, really look like, because these are just backgroundy, and I think I'm going to fade some in back here. Little bunches. Look at me just scribble, scribble, scribble. Okay, I've got some other bunches over here. They're coming from behind the grapes. The more behind the grapes they are, the less we want to see them. because They're going to be in the shadow. Okay, um, I think we need a little bungee bungee up here. Softer. hints of things going on all over the place here. And maybe that's too much of an outline. And there's something going on over here. And then of course we can't leave the bottom out. And I haven't drawn any over here, but we'll just tuck some things back here. Okay, now, next step is we're going to take one of our dried and smaller. This one's, I'm going to use the round one for this. This is the dome stencil brush. What the cool thing about these is, let me t explain, these are cut on a dome, and so what that means is they're not flat like most stencil brushes are, and that means that they won't leave a blunt like circle carved out, and so that just the tip will go there. Now, I'm going to mix khaki with my plum. 
Once again, colors from the palette. I'm going to dry it off on the paper towel. And then I'm just going to just give myself just a little bit of a highlight in circles. If you lose any bristles or if you lose any hairs or you get dust um, on your piece, that's just natural. Just brush it off and move on. The brush, my brushes have lasted forever. If you ever get a bad one, let me know and I'll replace it. Awesome. Okay, so see how easy that is to make a little bunch of grapes. Now I can go one up from that with a lighter color, dry it off on the paper towel, and just let a couple of my centered, out in the middle of things grapes get a little highlight. So they're just slightly more than the rest. Okay. And then we'll shade and we'll be about done. Oh, there it is. Lost my paintbrush. Okay, so we're going to take black plum. And I'm not going to tone this because it's already kind of a toned color. And I've shaded all on these sides. Some light's coming down from over here. So let me flip you around here. Okay, so I'm going to go in with my black plum and I'm just going to kind of use, see how I'm using the toe of this brush to just accent one side or the other. Down here, this, it doesn't have very much form at all. Okay, and then what we can do is we can take and kiss these leaves with just a little bit of that accent as well. We can bring a little bit of this into our leaf body. This color is so elegant. I love this color. As a matter of fact, I'll probably overdo it. I'll try not to. So we want to walk this color around a little bit. And let it make little family members out of the different leaves. That way it's not an isolated color. Okay, I'll come down here. Just fun to put little kisses of colors to places. done one of my favorite techniques and I think we have to and that's going to be the using the white wonder to spatter with. This is going to be a general spatter. I've got on the current tool TV I do a thing about um, spattering specifically. Like spattering exactly where you want to hit the mark. Spattering is just an amazing technique. I'm going to get some of that red in there with black. Always test your spatters off on paper towels on your um, on your palette. Sorry, this is kind of random spatters. Get out my Q-tip. I don't really want them so much on my leaves. Oh, let me show you that technique. Learn this great technique, Yvonne Creasel. Um, she's got some patterns on our website. Um, if you don't know who she is, she's worth looking up. She is amazing. She does this cool thing where she spatters at the ends of her leaves, and it makes the leaves look like they continue. Like they have little magic dust coming off of them. And you're 
make sure they go in the same direction. So if I'm doing that same technique, just a little bit. My spatter's kind of disappeared into the background. <clears throat> so add just a little bit. We're going to add celery green to attempt to um, give them just a little bit of sparkly, magical kind of stuff. But I think I'm going to need to go into my celery and give a couple of swipes on the leaves before I do this. Get you over here. Not everywhere, just a little bit. And now we'll just oops, you want to go in the direction you want the spatters to fall. We'll see how those die down when they dry. And I think we can go for just a little highlight on our grapes with a little plum plus khaki. See if that does just, just a little bit. chance and use a little bit of raw umber, traditional raw umber, and add a little bit more spattering around the edge. Spattering gives it the age. Make sure that you have plenty of liquid. We don't want too much of this spattering with, um, we want more snow spatter than we want trajectory spatters. up by using the varnish sponge. When you let things get hardened on your varnish sponge, you'll end up with these little um, hard parts of your sponge. Don't let that happen, otherwise you're going to have to throw it away or really spend some time picking the stuff off. Okay, just wipe straight on. What I love about varnishing is it always wake, enlivens or wakes up the colors. Now that's cool. Okay, our final step, because it's a Lazy Susan and you're going to have stuff on this Lazy Susan. Um, you're going to have ketchup bottles, you're going to have mustard things, you're going to have jam. You know, the grandkids are going to come over and they're going to have sticky hands. Um, not that my grandkids ever have sticky hands. Is we're going to add a layer of Clapham Salable Wax and what this is going to do for us is it's going to give us almost an impermeable surface. And if you put food on here, you can actually serve on this. So you could make it like a cheese party. Um, you could put your cheeses on this once you get it all varnished and, and protect it with the wax. The wax is food safe. I mean, you could you could eat it, I think, is what they say. Um, anyway, but what we're going to do is take just a little bit of wax, and we're going to just apply. My varnish is dry. We're going to apply an even coat all over it. And then it takes like a day. This also gives it a lovely sheen or luster, and it gives it a... Um, Gosh, the touch, the feel to it is just amazing. It just brings the quality of the piece up immensely. So I'm going to buff that on. Soft, lint-free paper towel. 
and the wax makes a super duper hard finish as well. Okay, so and it's just a real thin coat I'm putting on. You can reapply it if you feel like your luster or your, I don't know, if, it, if you start looking dry, um, then you can reapply it. You want to let it get really hard and dry, and so a day or so, depending on your humidity. And then you'll just take a clean paper towel and you'll just buff that off. You can also buff with a um, steel wool if you want to, always making sure that, of course, you're not removing anything that you shouldn't be removing. So I'll let that harden, I'll let that dry. Um, on my Lazy Susan, what I'll do is I will either stain or apply a color to this. Um, you want to finish it because when people, you know, you got your painted thing on here, if, if you lift that off, it just kind of looks a little tacky. Um, you could very well um, paint a different design on this, like an everyday design, and then save your plates for special times, um, however you want to go. But this little nugget guy right here, you paint that a uh, brown color, and then there's a wheel that you can buy. When you get the glass globe, you can get the, there's a wheel that magnets on there that holds that globe on so you don't have grandkids, once again, knocking it off. And then you can put your candle in the middle of it. So um, we've pretty much perfected this system. This is an invention of ours um, because I wanted to have that changeable Lazy Susan. We're the only people, I think, in the world that have a changeable Lazy Susan. So um, anyway, but you can buy the replacement nuggets really, really cheap, a buck or something like that, two bucks. Um, you can get the different wheels. Look at the Lazy Susan category on the website, and you'll see we have, I think this is the, the ninth, 19th or 20th pattern that we have for these. So there's a ton of patterns and you could use anybody's patterns. I hope that you've enjoyed the project. I know that I have been dying to do a grape cask Lazy Susan for ever and I'm glad I finally got it done. Now I feel like painting cask and grapes on everything. <laughs>